Welcome to r slash Petty Revenge, where OP gets revenge against a car thief. Our next Reddit post is from Internal Researcher. I went out to eat at a local fast food place before going to work. When I arrived, the parking lot was full except for one space, but some inconsiderate buffoon had parked across the line. I wasn't about to make myself late waiting for another space to open up. Thankfully, there was enough room for me to pull into this last space, which was next to the driver's door of the other car. My driver's door was next to the curb, so I had no trouble getting out. While I was inside waiting for my food, a woman came inside upset that someone had parked blocking her in. The manager went outside with her to look. While they were out there, my order was called, so I took my food and sat down to eat. My table was right next to the door. They came back in, and I heard the manager tell her there's nothing he could do because the other car is clearly parked in a single space. She proceeded to go table to table asking whose car that was because she needed to leave. For some reason, she never stopped at my table. After asking at a few tables, she gave up and went outside and sat on the front of her car. After I finished my meal, I walked out and got in my car. As I was walking to my car, I heard her on the phone talking, presumably to her boss, telling him that she was going to be late. I just drove away without even acknowledging her. And then OP clarifies, a common question in the comments was, why didn't she just get in the passenger side and slide over? Three reasons. One, she was a very large woman. Two, it was a compact car. Three, as I walked past her car, I saw that it was rather full of clutter, so there was no room to even get in the passenger side, let alone move across. Down in the comments, we have this reply from Deleted. You got her without, him crossing the line. Our next Reddit post is from Real Ovi. The people who lived below me in my apartment complex were apparently vampires. They would begin their evenings at about 11 p.m. and go to bed around 7 a.m., which was the exact opposite of my sleep schedule. Loud bass, tons of people over smoking, just bad apartment neighbors. We learned to deal with it. They got a couple of noise complaints from the other neighbors, and generally they got quieter the longer they lived there. However, they had comically loud, passionately hugging. Like, it sounded like two elephants jumping on top of each other. The walls were thumped, both parties screamed the whole time, just way over the top. It felt like they were trying to be jerks about it, as if they dared us to call the landlord to complain that they were loudly, passionately hugging. It was a lot like that scene in Forgetting Sarah Marshall where Jason Siegel and Mila Kunis were trying to one-up Kristen Bell and Russell Brand. After a couple of sleepless nights, my roommate and I exacted our revenge. We got a cheap, small karaoke machine at Goodwill and tied an extension cord around it. The next time the loud, passionate hugging happened, we lowered our karaoke machine outside their open window and started doing a play-by-play. Obviously, we couldn't see them, so we just made it up based on their noises. Oh my god, Ken, he put it in her butt. That's an expert move. Are those rubber sheets squeaking? It's about to get wet in here. Here we go. It's time for the big finish. Oh, wow. That's a Hall of Fame worthy skeet. It took just one night of this for them to knock it off. And down in the comments, we have a similar story from Gotwell Legs. Years ago, my boss had a couple who moved into her apartment above her. Their bedroom was directly above hers, and every other night she could hear them getting rowdy. She said something discreetly to them because she was worried her sons might hear them too. They brushed her off because they assumed she was just being a bigot because they were lesbians. So the next time she heard them, she started repeating in a loud dead pan everything they said back up at the ceiling. Oh yeah. Oh yeah! God yes, right there! God yes, right there! And so on. It took that time and once more about a week later to get them to quiet down, but it worked great. I tried the technique on a freaky neighbor years later. He just bashed on the wall and told me if I didn't shut up, I was next. Our next Reddit post is from Raris Pringle. I ran to the store to get a few things for my lunch break today. I didn't have much time, but I still respect the protocols of the store. Going down the aisles the proper way, social distancing, etc. A woman in the store kept going the wrong way down the aisles with her husband. She kept getting in the way of me and my boys and kept saying, Can you move? Every single time. I can't stress enough that even with huge arrows on the ground, she kept specifically making it out like it was my mission to get in her way. I politely moved each time, and being an anxious person even said sorry once or twice. Well, I get to the baking aisle and I see the Karen again. Again, going the wrong way. And again, she tells me to get out of her way. This time was special, though. You see, this time she tells her husband, Oh, they have caramel and dark chocolate sauces left. When she moves out of the way, grab them. They had one left of each. 
Did I know they existed before? No. Did I grab the last ones and also grab the last chocolate caramel just in case? Absolutely. Alright, so this is a cool story and everything, but hold on a second. There are arrows in grocery stores now? I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't been to the grocery store in over a year. Obviously, it's important to quarantine, but I'm effectively a professional voice actor, so if I get COVID, then in addition to the health risks, I also can't do my job for like two or three weeks. So as a result, I've been using grocery delivery services for the past year, so I didn't even know that there were arrows in grocery stores. Can anyone in the comments explain what's going on? Because I don't really get it. I'm assuming that there's like two lanes of arrows, one going one way and the other going the other way so that people have like their own lane of traffic in each aisle. But I don't really understand how that helps with COVID because you're still passing by each other. So how do those arrows help anyone? Our next Reddit post is from Deleted. This is a really dumb one, but it was satisfying. So why not share it? I'm a university student working a supermarket job that's just slightly above minimum wage. It's a nice enough job and the managers and colleagues are friendly, so I don't mind doing it. The customers are a mixed bag, though. Every single week without fail, this old woman comes in and asks for four gluten-free pizzas with triple mushrooms and triple bacon. She always arrives super late into the shift. Normally when we're running out of ingredients and are about to close, and it's usually hit or miss whether we have gluten-free bases in store. And you'd better believe she blames me when this happens. I don't mind taking large orders, but it's pretty inconvenient especially when she comes so late in the evening. Worse still, she always has an attitude and is overall a nightmare to deal with. I've always worked with the rule that if a customer is polite and nice to me, I'll return the favor and be nice back. This might mean I give them extra toppings or I'll work on the presentation a little more for them. Normally it just means I'll be friendlier to them. Similarly, if a customer is being a grunt, I'll put the bare minimum effort into whatever task I'm doing for them. I finish at the same time every week, 8pm. Today at about 7.15 I was closing my department. I had already covered the pizza ingredients, put away the utensils, etc. Midway through cleaning, the Omega Karen rolls up to the counter. I apologize and explain that I'm closing down and that I finish at 8pm. She immediately starts complaining that she was told they were open until 9pm. I tell her that the store is open until 9, but the pizza department closes at 8pm at the latest. And since I'm only working up until that point, I have to close everything down an hour earlier. She gets even angrier and walks off before returning maybe 5 seconds later after the thought of a sad, pizza-less night flashes through her tiny brains. And she tells me something along the lines of, No, you do have enough time. Stop cleaning and make me my pizzas. You don't close until you've done that. I argued back a little bit, but she was getting irritable, and as much as I like arguing with sucky customers, I don't want to get in trouble with my managers. So I just look at her and say, I'll go to the freezer and see if I have any gluten-free bases. So I dip out to the warehouse, knowing full well that we do have gluten-free bases, and I just chill there for about 10 minutes or so. I catch up with the warehouse team, check my phone, you know the rest. When I feel like enough time has passed, I head back and she's still waiting there. With the most deadpan voice I can muster, I just said, we don't have any of the gluten-free bases. The look of anger and defeat that flashed across her face was so satisfying. She kind of just threw her hands up before leaving and I got back to finishing cleaning up. The thing is, I don't mind making late orders for customers. It's super inconvenient and making a late pizza means I have to re-sanitize the surfaces, re-clean the utensils, etc. But if somebody's polite to me, I respect the urge for a late night pizza. If a customer is going to be a dick though, there's no way in hell I'm going to make that pizza. I will go out of my way to make sure they can't have it. OP, I totally respect your petty revenge against this woman, but I'm going to be honest with you. If I came into a supermarket that was open until 9pm and the pizza place was open until 8pm and it was 7.15pm, then yeah, I would expect to be able to buy a pizza. So like I said, I do respect your petty revenge here, but I better give you 1 out of 5 buttholes on this one. Our next Reddit post is from This Is My Username. So I worked at a company that had serious problems with appropriate authority. In our office, the office manager would routinely say terrible things about the company and encourage the text to quit and leave, etc. When I was hired, this office manager was looking for another job and she was letting the techs do whatever they wanted. I was hired as a supervisor and discovered several ethical violations and the quality of work from the techs was extremely poor. We had this one tech who was just flat out nasty. She was bigger and she tried to physically intimidate another supervisor who was very short by standing up over her and getting into her personal space because the supervisor called her out on trying to punish someone else. 
Basically, they got all pissed because they were allowed for who knows how long to do whatever they wanted. And when I showed up and said you have to do your jobs, they didn't like me. So one day, the next level up supervisor decides that we have to fill out a rubric on how well the techs are doing their jobs. Of course I get stuck with the nasty B word. I do my job, fill it out and give it to her to sign. She signs it, but acts like I took a giant dump in her cereal. Definitely a how dare you tell me how to do my job sort of situation. She begins saying really nasty things about me to corporate, saying I'm terrible and mean to her, saying I'm not providing enough supervision. Never mind she was constantly canceling so I would show up and she wouldn't be there. And she changed schedules with clients when she didn't have the authority to do so. She was a loud mouth so someone who didn't like her told me all about how she was trash talking me. Tired of all this BS, I said screw it. I quit and started my own company. I have been very happy since. Cue my petty revenge. A year later, I'm hiring for my company as I'm expanding, and guess who applies to work for me? Yup, nasty B word. I can't tell you how much pleasure I got out of declining her application and clicking that she was unqualified to apply. OP, you turned her down digitally? I can't believe you didn't call her in for an interview so you could watch her squirm in person. Our next Reddit post is from Darth Raider Vader. When I was 15, I began working, and by the time I was 17, I had enough money to buy my first car. Me being young and stupid, when my mother and stepdad said they were titling it in their name for insurance and registration purposes, I didn't question it. Six months later, they're divorcing. When the divorce was finalized, my mother informed me that my car, which I paid for, was going to my ex-stepdad in the divorce, since it was registered as joint property between them. I was furious! The car looked nice on the exterior, but burned through a quart of oil every two days and drove horribly, but it was still my car. The week before my ex-stepdad was due to pick it up, I quit putting oil in it. I drove around town extra that week. To top off my revenge, my friend had a goldfish die. It was a pretty big fish, 3-4 to four inches long. I asked for it. The morning of my car being taken in July, I cut the yellow foam beneath the passenger seat. The foam was sticky, abrasive, and resealed easily due to the stickiness. I cut the foam and stuffed the dead fish into the padding and pushed it as far over as I could. Then, the foam stuck back together quite nicely. He showed up with his girlfriend. His girlfriend was his mistress, thus causing the divorce. And he made a big show of giving my car as a gift to her. I just smiled. I wish I knew how well the car went over hours later in the hot July weather, but I can only imagine. And then down in the comments we have a similar story from Seriously Jan. Aren't these great parents? My mom co-signed for my older sister's car. And when the last payment was made, mom got the pink slip at her house and then finally stole the car from my sister's place of employment and sold it. My mom never made a payment on that car. So when my younger sister needed a car, my mom offered to co-sign. My older sister warned her, don't do it. My younger sister felt that wouldn't happen to her, but she got the exact same MO. Our mom stole the car from my younger sister's place of employment and sold it after all the payments were made. The police were called because my sister thought that her car was stolen until she got a call from her mom stating that she was taking her car back. Yeah, she was a great mom. Our next Reddit post is from Equivalent River. Ever since I switched my phone number, I've been getting text messages meant for someone else. I've gotten everything from her email password being changed to some random dude Venmoing her $50. I know her first and last name. I've spoken with her family too many times to count. It's gotten really frustrating. I tried to do this a nice way, but the message just won't get through to her. So today I decided to do something about it. I got a text message informing me of her eyebrow wax appointment. At first I tried to cancel it, but the message wouldn't go through, so now I have a master plan. I rescheduled her appointment, which would have been about 10 minutes ago as of writing this. I'm just gonna keep rescheduling her appointments until she gets the effing hint. Down in the comments, we have a similar story from Cussler Fan. I've had my number for 16 years. About 4 years ago, I started getting calls from numerous places trying to reach Crystal. It was everything from doctors to hairstylists to collection agencies. Then the credit card company started calling. I told them that it would appear that someone is trying to defraud them by purposefully giving them wrong information. When a day spa texted me an appointment reminder 2 weeks in the future, I replied with, Let's add a Brazilian wax and anal bleaching to the tab. I am starting to get a little messy back there. 
The day after the appointment, I got a call from the spa saying that she missed her appointment, but still owed for the services. I said, she had an unfortunate accident last week involving a potato, Vaseline, and a power drill. She's in a lot of pain right now, but we'll contact you soon once the stitches heal. I got a call from the woman herself two weeks later, yelling about how I'd embarrassed her at the spa, and that the credit card companies had all canceled her accounts, and that I should pay for it. I told her, well, I've been fielding calls for you for over a year. I got tired of it, and that was the only way that I figured that I would get them to stop. Besides, you obviously knew that it was the wrong number since four credit card companies plus your doctor's office, stylist, payday loan place, collection agency, and now you have called me at the same number. Go ahead, do your worst. The calls tapered off pretty quickly after that. That was our slash petty revenge, and if you like this content, check out my Patreon where I publish extra episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.